saw somebody? He had to go find some stuff. He said he was fine with us. Go ahead and start with that. Who's Mr. Harris? I'm sorry? Is Mr. Harris also fine with that? Mr. Harris? Oh, yes. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> okay. I heard Richard Harris, and I'm thinking of... Oh, the actor? Uh, yes, another part of my life has nothing to do with this, but... Oh, you like, Richard Harris you like, nomination and, you like musical theater? I'm not going to comment on that. I would vote for public judge. Oh, well, Maddox does. Tom. All right, now, now, now let's be adequately serious. All right, so Mr. Kilgore's um, stepped away to do some fine filing, which is fine with the court, because um, Mr. Larkin, you've been taking this portion uh, as uh, first chair. I just want to make sure the defendant was fine with uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Kilgore stepping away for a moment. Yeah, I just checked with him. He's fine. Okay, so everything's good. All right, we're ready to resume. We have uh, cross-examination now of uh, Detective Murphy. Detective, I would remind you that you're still on there. Got just brief redirect. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. I actually knew that. I didn't know that. Quite right. It's been a busy couple of days, I know. Um, all right, Detective Murphy, I want to talk um, some of, about some of the more recent things that were brought up. In other words, let's start with some of the things that were brought up today before I, I backtrack with you. Um, so, so first of all, there were some questions posed today about child abuse and about some of the charges in the successive warrants. And um, to bring us to the topic, the initial search warrants involved cruelty in the first versus cruelty in the second in some of the subsequent search warrants, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, to, to get to that point, you were asked questions about child abuse. Um, the, the term child abuse would it cover both of those charges. Yes. In other words, it, it could be child abuse under Georgia law to either commit cruelty in the first or cruelty in the second. There's a separate charges depending on the elements of the offenses. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> I um, noted in my notes, our notes, for your testimony, specifically for search warrant 0633. Uh, if you will, take a look at your notes for 0633. Uh, you were asked a line of questioning this morning about whether there was any discussion about conversations the defendant had with uh, extramarital um, affair individuals on the day of. Do you, do you remember having that discussion? Yes, sir. And looking back at your notes, what did you see regarding your testimony to uh, Judge Hicks regarding 0633 in particular and, and what did you share with him? I uh, shared with the judge that um, Mr. Harris had claimed he was happily married. Um, I mess message, uh, he me messaged other women making sexual comments, um, comments he had made the day of and prior to the incident. You included um, evidence that you had learned about conversations the defendant had that day since the first battery of search warrants. Yes. Okay. Um, 0635, can you identify what item that pertained to and where specifically that was recovered? The uh, MacBook Pro laptop, and that was recovered from the uh, residence. 1212 Winds Ridge Circle. And is that the one that you actually did some analysis on? Yes, sir. Looking at the substance of what you found on that um, computer, was there anything that you located on there to indicate that the defendant was using that computer as opposed to his wife? No, everything that I saw appeared to be from a female, which would have been his wife. Including the text messages and the content? Yes, sir. Um, I want to clarify about the, um, the scope of your search for that particular device. We'll stay on that device for a moment. Um, when you were exploring the contents of the text messages, were you also looking for some of the things described in the search warrants, such as content involving marital issues, child issues, and financial issues? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> 
you were asked this morning about search warrant 0844. Um, and I want to, can you get your copy of that? Or if you need that, can you just say exhibit? You have that in front of you? Oh. Give me one second. Yes, I have it. Okay. Um, you correctly corrected yourself about something that the magistrate judge had done in this case regarding the search warrant itself. Which judge were we talking about? That was uh, Judge Inman. Judge Inman. And on, on the search warrant, the defense pointed out that there was a portion that was actually removed from the search warrant, though it remained in your affidavit. Do you recall that? Correct. It was uh, communications with other people on the days leading up to and the incident date. Great. So my follow-up to you is looking at the search warrant affidavit, did she remove your ability to search for all communications or just communications from that day or leading up to it? Uh, she just removed the part with the communications on that day and leading up to it. Specifically yeah. looking at the search warrant itself, can, can you just point out and read the portion for the court on search warrant ending 0844, uh, which part still retained emails and communications? Um, emails and communications regarding child, wife, and family issues. And, and for our record, the, the subject of this search warrant was the um, Lenovo that had been, we believe, out of the defendant's possession for some time. Is that correct? Yes, that was the one that um, Home Depot had custody of that uh, was his work computer up until March of 2014. Did the search warrant still authorize you to look for historical emails and communications that may have shown difficulties between the defendant, his wife, um, the child, and financial issues? Yes. For, for this particular search warrant, and there was another one that was used to obtain it, where specifically was this item of evidence recovered from and who did it belong? Uh, Home Depot. And it was it collected from Home Depot corporate office? Yes, Home Depot corporate office at 2455 Paces Ferry Road, Atlanta. Pursuant to which search warrant was it actually recovered from Home Depot corporate office? Uh, search warrant 0816. Similar line of questioning regarding search warrant 0641. Um, do you have your copy of 0641 by chance in front of you? Just give me a second. Oh, yes, I do. Okay. Looking at 0641, first question, what was the subject matter that was sought pursuant to that search warrant? The um, HR records regarding uh, Justin Harris. And on whom or what entity was that search warrant executed to get those HR records? It's uh, Home Depot Corporate Headquarters at 2455 Paces Ferry Road. Were those records ever recovered from the defendant's possession, his house, or his vehicle? No. In whose possession were those records actually in prior to execution of the search warrant? Uh, Home Depot, corporate. There have been a um, number of search warrants that you testified about over the, the past couple of days. Um, at, at, if the defendant had only had one laptop and one cell phone on him initially, would that have impacted the number of search warrants you sought and obtained in this case? Yes, it would have. We would have only had to have gotten the, uh, that phone and that laptop, not a whole vehicle full of electronics. Okay. And um, if, if you gained new information from having obtained those initial two items and necessitated you getting subsequent warrants to expand the scope, would, would the number of those supplemental uh, search warrants been limited as well? Yes, it would have been limited to just those two items. And, and why is it that we have so many in this particular case for um, all of the items that you testified about for the past two days? Uh, we got a, there's a large uh, number of electronics and internet devices, such as computers and 
that type of thing. Consistent with that, is there anything about the defendant's statement to Detective Stoddard that you reviewed um, that indicated that he had an affinity for electronics as opposed to somebody who not, might not be as uh, electronically savvy to say? Um, he worked in um, as a web designer. He worked with electronics and computers. The term homicide that we've used uh, through, throughout uh, your, your testimony the past couple of days, would that incl include intentional as well as neglect homicides? Yes, it would. You, you didn't um, limit in your search warrant whether you were, in any of these search warrants, whether you were calling the homicide malice murder versus felony murder. It would encompass both of those. Would you agree? Yes. And the instances where the code section cited, you cite 16.51. To your knowledge, the 16.51 contain uh, both of those. And now, um, af after um, it's actually got an additional uh, type of uh, murder that was not in play at the time. Is that correct? Yes. There was some questioning that was posed yesterday about um, obtaining search warrants and, and why you have obtained them so quickly. Can you articulate for the court and for this record well, whether there's a concern about the timely obtaining and execution of search warrants in a homicide investigation? Well, you don't want to lose um, evidence such as at the residence, things of that nature. We don't know who's at the residence until we get there. And um, just there's, there's a time restraint on wanting to get there and recover this evidence. At the point of the initial investigation, the initial obtaining of the search warrants on the 18th and 19th, were, were you even clear whether a, a single person might be charged or could there have been other people that might have been involved? No, uh, we didn't know if it was one person or multiple people involved. Okay. And, and what, was that a factor that you, that you thought about in, in determining whether you wanted to, in a timely fashion, obtain search warrants for the vehicle, the home, and electronic devices? Yes, it was. To at least seize them? Yes, it was. There was some questioning posed about, um, I believe this was yesterday, uh, about what information you had about certain devices and, and, and videos and news clips that could have been watched. Did the defendant, when you went back and reviewed his statement, limit in his statement what device he could have used to view any of those things, or did he say one way or another? He did not limit, just simply say that he had viewed it. Having said that he viewed news reports and, and clips of deaths in, in car, did you know at the time of the attaining of these search warrants which particular device he had viewed that on, or could it have been any of them? It could have been any of them. Did, did he specify, do you recall, during his interview that you subsequently watched, whether the news report was something he saw on TV versus a news report that could be viewed online by, by way of a news clip or something like that. He did not. Could that have been viewed uh, on any of the devices that you obtained search warrants for? Yes. For search warrant 0605 in particular, I want to talk about the dialogue that was played regarding the judge. There was a question or a colloquy, I'll say, between you and the judge about what you believed versus what you could prove at that time. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. And um, d describe for the court what that colloquy was and why you were careful to talk about what you could prove at that time versus what you believe. Um, Judge Inman had questioned the uh, cruelty in the first charge and uh, mentioned was it under malice and I stated no it wasn't and she questioned me if I believed it was there was malice and I say yes I did I believe that it possibly was involved malice was involved in it. I just, were you also careful, though, to limit uh, um, at that time the testimony about what he had been currently charged with versus what you, you believe you might be able to eventually show? Yes. And um, to describe, if you will, in your own words, um, I know the, the, the court heard that recording yesterday, but just describe in your own words what it is you are attempting to do when you're talking to judge, the judge about that. 
I'm sorry, specifically about the... About what he was charged with at that time versus what you believe. Um, I was just explaining to her that, you know, he's, he was being, at that time, charged with cruelty in the first and a homicide. And I was describing that the homicide was in relation to the cruelty charge. And um, she brought up the malice, and I simply said that, yes, as referring to, I believe there was malice involved, and left that that didn't explain any further to her. Almost done with the redirect on you. I've got just a couple more questions. Um, yesterday, you were asked some questions about the June 19th testimony about the series of search warrants that were obtained. Um, do you recall in 0605 any oral testimony about um, the, the research that had been done, including deaths in cars, both of animals and, and, and also children? Yes. And was that incorporated for all of the search warrants that were obtained on that particular day? Yes, it was. You were asked whether you attempted to find any uh, videos or news reports yourself about um, deaths in cars, the vet car. H had you done that, absent receiving these search warrants, would you have been able to tell whether the defendant viewed that particular uh, video clip or not? No, I would not. What was the only way to determine which specific video clip he might have seen to the exclusion of others? Go into the devices and find it. Is it possible to know definitively uh, what evidence is on a device or in a crime scene or otherwise until you first obtain the search warrant? No, you don't know what's going to be there until you obtain the search warrant and actually go and look. I think that's all I have for you. Just briefly, are you suggesting that you cannot investigate a crime scene without a search warrant? No, you can't investigate a crime scene without a search warrant. Okay. And you can investigate other people related to a crime scene without a search warrant? Yes, you can. And you can investigate uh, electronic devices without a search warrant as to what they are and what they do? As just researching what they can do? Sure, that's a good word. I'm sure you can research and see what they can do prior to the search warrant. Okay. And uh, you can talk to other individuals. And in fact, if it's a normal citizen who's not been charged, you can just walk up to them and start talking to them about questioning what they might or might not have seen or looked at or watched. Correct? Yes. And when Mr. Harris was interviewed, uh, he could have been asked, now, this new show, what, what new show are you talking about? He could have been asked that, correct? He could have. Okay. In fact, you don't really know what he was asked because you weren't even there to see the interview itself, correct? I was not involved in the interview. <clears throat> this, this research and word just came to you from somebody who was watching it that passed along to you before you went to get the search warrants? Yes. And... This timeliness of obtaining evidence to prevent loss of evidence. <clears throat> you do not have one scintilla of evidence that there was going to be any loss of evidence in this case at the time that you went to get a search warrant, correct? I'm sorry. The question has come that you need to timely get a search warrant so that there's no pr pr destruction of evidence. Yes. Okay. We understand that happens in some cases. Particularly drug cases, we see it a lot where someone might be obtained uh, destroying drugs or destroying records of drug transactions, things of that nature, correct? Right? Yes. But this case was a very unique case because you're dealing with a child that died in a car and the only person who was with him you have in custody, correct? Correct. The only person that was with him was in custody. Very good. And you had not one scintilla of evidence that there was any other piece of evidence out there that could be destroyed. We didn't know at the time if anybody else was involved with it or not. Right. And nothing prevented you from investigating it, did it? No, we were investigating it. Right. And your way of investigating was go get a bunch of search warrants and get somebody's house and somebody's life, correct? We acquired search warrants to search the residence, yes and search every electronic device you could find just to see what may be we, going on in his life, correct? We searched it based on uh, Mr. Harris's statements and the evidence we had in the case. 
Well, actually, you didn't do it based on the statements. You did it based on some unknown detective statement saying that he researched something when, in fact, he never did research. Correct? Using my term of research as gaining information, he did. I, you're right. Using your terminology. You never bothered to explain to the magistrate your terminology of what you mean by research, correct? In, um, during my testimony? They never asked? He didn't ask. Did you think that the magistrate was using a normal English definition of research when he heard you use that word? I don't know what kind of definition they would have used. Okay. But if you're using something specific to you, don't you think that would be helpful to tell the magistrate that here's what I mean when I'm using this term? They never asked what I meant by research. You asked the question about the substance of the MacBook Pro analysis. Yes, sir. Um, in looking through all that, at least 10 hours worth, I think you guesstimated, you never found one single piece of evidence that supported the theory that Mr. Harris had intentionally done anything to harm his child on that day, correct? Through that computer? Correct. No, I did not. couple follow-ups from that yes, cross. Um, did the defendant's statement link his child to his home prior to the child's death on the date uh, of the crime? Yes, he did. He said that they left the house to go to Chick-fil-A. And um, did, did he provide a timeline to you and Cobb County Police Department during, during his interview about that that you shared with the magistrate court judges? Yes. You were asked about um, being able to, to question uh, somebody like a defendant. Must you cease the questioning if the person asks for a lawyer, as the defendant did in this case? Yes, if they ask for a lawyer, it's you stop the interrogation or questioning. Similarly, if a wife refused to speak with a lawyer and retain counsel, um, might that impact your ability to continue to speak with them? Yes, it would. All right, thank you. But that hadn't happened when he was talking about watching news reports happen. No, it had not. Thank you. Anything further? Witness can stand there. Thank you. Proceed to the defense. Sorry. Proceed to the defense. I think the state may have another witness or two. Good, good. Sorry. I was just handing off the baton. I know you're going to be talking the whole time I'm here, but I don't mind if they go with that. I was just handing off the baton to Smith. I think so. Judge, just for the purpose of some issues regarding things alleged in the defense's motion, we're going to call Ray Yeager. I do. Yes. Sir, if you could please introduce yourself to the judge by telling her your name. My name is uh, Ray Yeager. Can you spell that for the court reporters? So it's Y E A G E R. And where do you work currently? Uh, currently, I'm a reserve police officer, officer with Cobb County Police Department. And what's your job there? What do you do as a reserve officer? Uh, I do administrative de details for the police department to keep from having to bring officers in off the road. Did you formerly work for <laughs> Cobb County Police uh, before becoming a reserve officer? I did. I worked for Cobb County for 13 years, uh, the last seven of which I was in the high-tech crime squad doing a uh, investigations into uh, computer crimes and also digital forensics for the entire department. So is it okay if I refer to you as Detective Yeager? That's fine. Have it. Okay. And uh, Detective, there's no jury here and we're here for a specific purpose, so I'm going to ask you just some preliminary questions about your background sure. and becoming a, a high-tech investigator. Uh, did you start out in law enforcement? I did not. I uh, spent 33 years in information technology profession uh, prior to coming into law enforcement. 
However, concurrent with that, I was spent 21 years with the City of Miami Beach Police Department as a reserve police officer there. And did you leave Miami and come to Cobb County to work full time uh, as a police officer and detective? I, I did. And what type of work did you do working with technology both in Miami and the police as it relates to law enforcement? Uh, as it relates to law enforcement, uh, I've been involved in doing forensics on any kind of digital device, meaning uh, computer, uh, mobile devices, GPS, uh, game systems, things of that nature, any electronic digital device. And over the course of those many years, uh, I'm not calling you old, but uh, <laughs> have you had any training uh, specific to forensically examining and acquired data uh, and evidence from computers, cell phones, and technology? Yes, I've had training on uh, NCASE uh, product, which is a forensic software product for uh, computers, also FTK, as well as uh, Celebrite, and, which is a uh, forensic software package for mobile devices, as well as other uh, mobile device uh, packages. And I've had that, that training through uh, software vendors, uh, the, the creators of those products, as well as uh, through the Secret Service and the FBI. Have you ever, uh, can you even estimate to the judge how many cases you've been involved with over the years regarding uh, analyzing and gaining evidence from technology? Uh, I would say there's probably in the realm of uh, 500 cases that I've analyzed over the course of the seven years I was in there. And during the seven years you were in there, were you ever called to testify? I was. And was that both in federal court and state court? Yes, it was. Could you tell the judge a little bit about uh, the high tech unit and what your general responsibilities were there? We are a support unit for the entire police department. If uh, any officer uh, encounters a device during the course of an, uh, an investigation that they have seized and have uh, proper documentation in terms of search warrant or consent, we then uh, take that device in, into our unit and we will then uh, analyze the device. Um, depending on the device, we'll go through a procedure of which we have standard procedures for different devices uh, within our unit. And depending on the case, and I guess the, the level of the investigation and what you're actually, the search warrant's calling for, um, does it, do you sometimes actually just acquire information and the evidence and turn it over to the detectives? And are there times where you actually do a preliminary or some type of search of the evidence that you found on the computer? Depending on the case, uh, we will do some searching ourselves within our unit. But since we're not intimately involved with the circumstances of the case and the individuals involved in the case, we will generally uh, image the device or make a, a forensic copy of the device then provide that back to the investigator for them to peruse and to determine what's needed for their case. If it is something with a great amount of information and they're seeking a great amount of information, um, do you go in and just pull specific things out or do you actually image the entire device and turn it over to the detective then to, uh, to narrow the scope of his investigation? In, in every case, we image the, in, oh, I shouldn't say it, not in every case, in the majority of the cases, we'll image every device. Um, if we have a situation, uh, as an example, where we have a consent and we want to just get videos or text messages off a phone, we can do that. Uh, in that case, we're not usually seizing the device itself, but we're, we have a consent to do it. And we do that out of... Uh, timeliness for the, uh, the person that's consenting so that we don't keep them there for a couple of days while we image the device. And when you image a device, uh, is that also a timeliness uh, consideration that you had there too as far as imaging it versus trying to go in and sit down and look at the device either in a person's home or back at your uh, unit? Yeah, the, the thing about imaging the device is that when we create that copy of the device, we are not looking at the original device itself and therefore we're not changing any data that's on the original device. So by making that image copy, we can go in and look at that uh, without changing the results of either the, the image or the original device. So that for that reason, we will usually always image the entire device. And, and the process for finding evidence on a computer versus a phone, does that differ somewhat? Very much. If you look at uh, mobile phones, the amount of memory that they have it has increased recently, but the max you usually have is about 64 gigabytes, mm -hmm. which is 64 million characters, okay? 
Um, whereas on a computer, you could be in the billions of characters, uh, which would store what we now know as terabytes, which would store a lot more information, be a lot more difficult to uh, go through all that data in a timely fashion. And I'm going to turn your attention to the case of State of Georgia versus Justin Ross Harris. Uh, are you familiar with this investigation and were you involved in the investigation uh, as far as high tech was concerned? Yes, I'm familiar with it and yes, I was involved with it. And were there a number of devices that you actually uh, did some work on in this case pursuant to, pursuant to search warrants? Yes, there are. Uh, and Detective, I'm just going to go through, uh, would it help you if we go through device per device uh, just to, to tell the judge what you did and then we're going to start with on the first type of either phone or computer explain everything you do and then we'll kind of summarize as we go to the next similar device okay sure if i could uh I, we really break it down into three parts just so okay. um and that's what i'll do with each one first right. thing is we actually bring the device into our unit we acquire uh, physically acquire the device mm -hmm. after that we will uh, photograph and record all the external information about the device labels, tags, uh, serial numbers that are on the device. Um, we will, in the case of mobile devices, if there is a SIM card or a storage card in the device, we will remove those and uh, analyze those separately. Um, and in the case of a computer, we'll, we will remove the hard drive if it's possible to do that. Um, so we acquire, physically acquire the device into our possession, document, with pictures and recording of serial numbers. And then after that, we do an acquisition. In the case of a computer, we do an acquisition where we attach the hard disk drive to a write blocker. That prevents any uh, new data from being written onto the original suspect drive. Okay. We then make a copy of that onto another drive that we then use to do the forensics on. In the case of mobile devices, we acquire the data through a, 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 it's a, really a parsing algorithm from Celebrite that uh, knows the format of pictures and directories, et cetera. And it actually goes into the phone and then extracts all that information onto a copy of it. So it doesn't so much cop make an exact image of the mobile phone as it collects all the information that's on that phone, including deleted data in some cases. Okay, so that's what I'll go through when I talk about these devices. Great. Okay. All right. So starting with that, let's start with um, what has been uh, referred to here as an iPhone 5, which was the subject of, for the record, search warrant 14 SW0599 on June 18, 2014, and uh, search warrant 14 SW0660 which a search warrant was executed uh, or signed on the 27th of June, 2014. Uh, what did you do initially on June 19th, 2014, regarding this iPhone 5 uh, that was allegedly taken from the defendant's person? Um, we uh, brought it into our possession. Um, I just want to check. The iPhone 5 was uh, delivered to uh, High Tech Crimes by Detective Murphy um, physically, so he, we made that exchange at the High Tech unit. So we received that from him, um, performed a physical examination, uh, took pictures of the, uh, the cell phone itself, uh, did an acquisition of that um, using Celebrite, um, and saved the extract onto our uh, Celebrate Forensic Workstation. Now, as far as the overarching everything on that cell phone, did you do any kind of search of all of the stuff on the cell phone on that day? No. Okay. Now, were you asked to, pursuant to request from the detectives and uh, pursuant to their search warrant, to do a limited uh, search for certain things? Uh, contacts with people from the day of June 18th, um, messages and contacts with uh, his wife, Leanne, and things of that nature? Uh, we were. Let me just take get to that point. And just for the record, did you, did you do supplemental reports in this case? I did. Okay, and would a refresher recollection of points to go back and look at some of these reports uh, to be able to testify accurately to the judge? That is why I have that. Okay, thank you. Okay. So on that iPhone 5, um, on um, June 20th, 
Um, I provided hard copy reports from the iPhone 5 to Detective Murphy, specifically contact information for an Angie K, who has, uh, had a screen name of Dark Phoenix 1982, also the call log from June 18th and 19th, and then uh, call logs between the, that of iPhone 5 and Leanna Harris. And, and was that, that was a hard copy printed report. And was that the limit of what you did uh, as far as any type of search on the iPhone 5? Yes, other than the acquisition of the entire phone, that's the only searching I did. Okay. And regarding that, uh, the acquisition of it, do you, are you familiar with what happened or if it was the actual copy of that image being provided to law enforcement? Or who actually created the disk uh, of that actual uh, image? Well, I created the, the, the image okay. uh, when I acquired the, the cell phone, okay? So when I say I use Celebrite and save the image onto the, uh, the Celebrite forensic workstation, that's a function I did. Then from that, mm -hmm. I extracted the information that I just uh, spoke about. Okay. And did that end your uh, involvement with that iPhone 5? Uh, no, uh, I'm sorry. On uh, July 25th, I also created a CD with that same information that I just mentioned and uh, recorded that into uh, on a CD, made three copies, put it in evidence. Uh, I believe I provided, yeah, provided one copy to a detective in the uh, person's unit. Okay, thank you. All right, moving along to the uh, Dell Tower computer that is subject of search warrants 14 SW0605 from June 19, 2014, and search warrant 14 SW633 from the 24th of June, 2014. I think this will be a real quick one. Uh, yep. What did you do with that uh, computer? Um, I did a physical examination, uh, took photographs. Um, and I believe there was no computer in, or no um, hard drive in that. So there was nothing further done at that point, is that correct? Right, there was no hard drive in that computer, so that was the extent of it. Going to uh, with a Google, what has been called a Google Chromecast, referred to in search warrants 14 SW0606 on June 19, 2014, and search warrant 14 SW0634 from June 24, 2014. Um, tell the, the judge what you were able to and if you were able to actually do anything with that device. Uh, I researched the device and found that there was no forensic software available at that time to extract data from that device. And, and I, I believe that was probably true until um, a couple of months ago. So at no point while you were with Cobb County Police were you able to obtain any information or have the capability to obtain any True. information? True, that's correct. Right. Moving to the Apple MacBook Pro that was uh, taken from the uh, residents at Wines Ridge pursuant to search warrants 14 SW0607 on June 19, 2014 and also pursuant to search warrant 14 SW0635 on June 24, 2014. Uh, could you tell the judge, um, what's the first thing you did and what date did you do that first act uh, with the Apple MacBook Pro from the residents? Uh, the first date was on um, June, June 20th. I retrieved that uh, device from the Crimes Against Persons evidence room. And uh, did you do anything further on the 20th on that day? No, I did not. Uh, what is the next, uh, well, I'll turn your attention, I think it's June 23rd of 2014. Right. Did you do something further with that actual uh, computer on that day? Yes. Uh, after I took the photographs, recorded serial numbers, then I removed the hard drive from that and did a, an image, created, performed a uh, forensic image using a, a write blocker and made a copy of that image to uh, a hard drive that is kept in the high-tech crime unit. Okay. And after you actually created that, on that day, did you actually do any type of search of what was on that uh, device? Or was that a later date where you actually did some type of limited search? That was um, a later date. So. 
After I did the acquisition, that was on June 23rd. After that acquisition was done, I placed the hard drive back in the computer uh, to be placed back into evidence. Um, following that, um, on June 26th, I provided uh, seven files from that MacBook uh, on an optical disc to Detective Murphy. Uh, there were files that uh, just by their, their name, and I believe I did actually go in and look at some of them, but felt that they may per be pertinent to the case. Um, they were named Cooper's Week Chart, uh, another one called My Personal Credo, another one Baby Names, um, then another one I Just Wanted to Let You Know, another document It's Time, another document See to Believe, and the seventh document Wish List. And do these documents all um, appear to be related to the, the family situation? Uh, the, the child in this case, or I guess the, the marital situation between the defendant and Leanna Harris? They, they all uh, spoke to something that may be, have a personal interest inside of them. Uh, since the uh, deceased was named Cooper, I figured that that was of interest to us. And this was uh, on the 26th of June? Correct. correct. So subsequent to that last search warrant on the 24th of June, correct? Correct. Okay. So after that, on uh, June 27th, um, I made a copy. I also ran Internet Evidence Finder. Internet Evidence Finder is a, is a software package that uh, goes out and selects any information that accesses the Internet. So it'll be searches, it'll be URL, uh, Universal Resource Language uh, um, Connections, uh, which is a website, um, and it, also any cookies that have been left by um, applications that have been visited and may have left cookies on the machine to say that that site was visited so that the next time you go into it there's less administrative uh, processing to go on. So I ran Internet Evidence Finder and provided a copy of that also to Detective Murphy and put uh, two other copies on disk into evidence. Okay. And finally, uh, that was the 27th of June. Correct. correct? And moving finally to the August the 4th of 2014, uh, did you do anything further? Uh, it would have been uh, July 25th. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, July 25th, I just uh, created the seven files I had given to um, Detective Murphy on June 26th. I created additional uh, files so that I could store them in evidence, uh, exact same copies. So I did that on uh, July 25th. And did you do anything further or turn in anything or, or create any analysis on August the 4th of 14 uh, regarding this, files of note uh, on the disk? I probably did, and it's on another supplement. I'm going to turn your attention to, I believe it's page 259 of your supplemental report. Okay, I have it here. Okay, <clears throat> okay on, um, on August 4th, Okay, on August 4th, um, I completed additional analysis on the Apple MacBook Pro. Um, also found 13 files of interest in that document. Uh, would you like me to name them or? Uh, let me ask you to summarize. Were those all related to the marital issue, the child, and things of that nature? It, it appeared that they were. It had uh, Leanna's name, Cooper's name on, again, wish list, baby names, things of that nature. My personal credo. And were these all doc in, in the document section, or documents that were created, not web searches and things like that? Uh, some were documents. Uh, I have noticed one here is a, a, a sonogram video. Mm -hmm. um, the rest were documents. I also found um, three images of Cooper in a car seat transport, mm -hmm. uh, just to demonstrate the growth of the victim. 
I had 15 images of Cooper in a front-facing car seat, um, and he was in a front-facing car seat as late as 529 prior to his death, and then 20 images of Cooper in a rear-facing car seat, um, and he was in that car seat as late as 524, 14 prior to his death. And my note here is it appears to have outgrown the seat. <clears throat> and from looking at this computer, as far as the limited basis that you did in looking through the, the documents that you did, did this uh, computer appear from everything to belong to Leanna Harris? I do believe so. All right, I'm going to turn your attention now to... Yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Turn your attention to what uh, we refer to here in court as the Lenovo T530 which is the subject of search warrants 14 SW608 on the 19th of June 2014 and 14 SW636 on the 24th of June 2014. Uh, on the 20th of June 2014, was that the first time you had any, I guess, interaction with that computer? Yeah, the, the uh, well, the, when I s picked it up from the person's ER uh, evidence room back on, um, June 20th was the first time I came across that. Then um, after that, on um, June 26th is when I ran um, in an internet evidence finder against that. And what day was it that you actually um, acquired the, first acquired the image and did you have to contact somebody uh, specifically to be able to get on that computer? Yes, uh, the uh, computer was BitLock encrypted, which means it's uh, BitLocked at the uh, operating system level, meaning that the entire disk is encrypted. Uh, it, the registered owner of that computer was Home Depot. So Home Depot was the owner of this computer? Yes. Yes. All right. And did you contact, was Home Depot contacted to be able to get permission to go into that computer? Yes, I did make contact with them, uh, asked permission, also asked uh, if they could provide the, the BitLocker encryption key, which they did, at which time I was able to um, unlock the computer and um, do the acquisition. And after doing the acquisition, what day was that on? That was on um, 6.25. Okay. And then you said you ran the Internet Evidence Finder uh, later, correct? Right. I ran that on um, 6.27. Okay. And also on, on 6.26, um, I found uh, five links to social media URL Reddit, R-E-D-D-I-T that link to a uh, content titled child free, one word. And so getting to that now, on the 26th after that 24th search warrant, did you do a limited search um, regarding, uh, I guess, web links involving children and things of that nature? Yes. Okay. And based upon that limited search, you found these things involving child free? Correct. Okay. Now what did you do based upon uh, gaining that information? Well, I provided, uh, I placed that information on optical disk and provided that to Detective Murphy for his further investigation. <clears throat> so now I'm going to turn your attention to a My Passport external hard drive, which is the subject of search warrant 14 SW0654 uh, from June 27, 2014. Okay. Uh, what was the first day that you actually, I guess, started on this one and acquired an image from the external hard drive? Okay, let me just find that search warrant on my... Uh... Okay. Okay, again, the first contact would have been on uh, June 20th when I retrieved it from the evidence room and persons unit. <clears throat> Then on uh, July 8th, I actually acquired an image of that. Prior to that, 
uh, I did the physical examination, took pictures, but on July 8th, I actually acquired a digital image of, uh, of that device. And on the uh, 4th of August 2014, did you do a forensic analysis or uh, create a forensic analysis of the uh, external hard drive? I did. Okay. And what did you do on that occasion? What day? I think August 4th, 2014. Yes, I did. Uh, on that date, I found uh, five files of uh, fifteen files of interest um, on that passport drive. Uh, one was a. Uh, some of them, quite a few of the files seem to re be related to law enforcement. Um, did you also fall? Uh, uh, locate any involving Alabama child restraint laws? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's called Alabama. The file is Alabama, Alabama Child Restraint Law 2006 LE. <clears throat> okay. Did you find anything uh, other about, I guess, Mr. Harris? Did you know anything about his background or his job or business or employment? Um, I, I had heard and it wasn't in a conversation, it might have been overheard, but I heard that he had some involvement, in, involvement with law enforcement previously in a career capacity. I'm going to turn your attention now to, uh, I guess, a sand disk. Uh, that'd be a thumb drive, flash drive, subject of search warrant 14, SW0653. Okay, uh, yeah, that's a Sandisk, that's a USB thumb drive. And regarding that search warrant that was issued on the 27th of June 2014, uh, did you acquire an image of what was on that? <clears throat> I did. Um, it was a 32 gigabyte thumb drive, and I acquired that on July 7th. 2014? 2014, yes. And did you do any type of search on that? I did not. And moving along to another, an SD card, which is the subject of search warrant 14 SW655, uh, issued on the 27th of June 2014. Uh, did you also acquire an image of the evidence, if there was any, on that uh, yes, SD on, card? Yes, on uh, July, July 7th, 2014. And did and you, so go ahead, go ahead. I did no searches on that. Now, were there a couple of devices that actually the evidence was acquired from and that neither you nor the other uh, high-tech employees did any kind of search on as well? Yes. Uh, let's see. Now, I'll turn your attention first. Were you familiar with an iPhone 4 uh, subject of search warrants 14 SW0611? and 14 SW0639. Yeah, that acquisition was performed by uh, Detective Smith. Okay. Going to the Apple MacBook that was uh, located in the uh, defendant's vehicle subject to search warrants 14 SW0609 and search warrant 14 SW0637. That Apple MacBook, um, did another detective actually acquire the uh, image on yes. that computer? Detective Colson did that. Okay. And I think the other one that he, 
did not do any work on, uh, so to speak. Was he, the iPad? The Apple iPad was done also by Detective Smith. Okay, and just for the record, that's 14 SW0610 and 14 SW063A, correct, Detective? On the uh, iPad? Yes, sir. 610 and 638, yes. Great. Uh, were there also some DVD-Rs that were located? There were. Okay. Um, I did look at those, and uh, I labeled them 1 through 8. Okay, and pursuant to search warrants 14 SW0656, uh, what day did you acquire that? Uh, those you don't acquire because okay. by their nature they're they're right protected. Okay. But I viewed those on July seventh, two thousand fourteen. Okay. And did you view anything of note? I did not. And finally, as far as the devices, I believe you were involved with uh, the Lenovo five one zero laptop uh, on the 29th, or excuse me, not twenty ninth. Uh, Got it listed as search warrant 29. Search warrant 14 SW0816 executed on the 14th of August 2014. Did you actually uh, perform any analysis or perform any uh, job on that laptop starting on September 25th, I believe, or 26, 2014? You're referring to the Apple MacBook Pro and the no, I'm sorry. There the, the uh, subsequent uh, Len Lenovo 510 oh, okay. was obtained later. Um, I guess act actually after the initial wave of the investigation. Right. I did uh, perform the image and the forensic analysis on that. And did you do any type of search of that, or did you turn the disk over to the detectives as well? Give me one second. I'll check. Okay, I received a, a request to, to do forensics on that on August 19th. And on August 26th of 2014, I retrieved that device from the person's uh, evidence room. On August uh, 27th, I acquired a copy of that drive, or a copy of that system. And again, I found that it was, I'm sorry, I didn't cop, I, I was unable to cop, uh, make an image because it was bit, uh, Microsoft BitLock as well. Again, I contacted Home Depot. They gave me the encryption key. I unencrypted it, was able to make a, uh, an image of it. So again, that, that was property of Home Depot. Yes, that was. Now, other than the ones we've, uh, we've talked about, uh, did you do any further analysis uh, on any other devices in this case that you can recall? Not that I recall them. And other than we talked about, did you do any um, uh, search uh, of anything other unless you were directed by the detectives in this case? I did not. Just have a second, Judge. That's all I have.